Thank you very much. So I am going to spend the next 15 minutes giving a simplified account of the mathematics for which Andrew Wiles has just won this year's Arbel Prize. So let's go straight to the citation. The citation says, let's read it out, for his stunning proof of Fermat's last theorem by way of the modularity conjecture for semi-stable elliptic curves opening a new era in number theory. Now there are two elements in this statement that I want to highlight. Fermat's last theorem and the modularity conjecture. I will explain what both of these things are, how they relate to each other, and the work and the role of Andrew Wiles. So, where do we start? Let's start at the beginning. Let's start with Pythagoras' theorem. This is the most famous theorem in mathematics. It is, rhetorically, for right angle triangles, the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. So if the hypotenuse is Z or Z, the other two sides are x and y, it says that x squared plus y squared is equal to z squared. Now, if there are whole numbers such that, whole numbers x, y, and z, such that that equation is satisfied, we call these numbers Pythagorean triples. They're the whole numbers, solutions for x squared plus y squared equals z squared. For example, most simply, 3, 4, and 5, because 3 squared, which is 9, added to 4 squared, which is 16, equals 25, which is 5 squared. It also works with 5, 12, and 13, and this big number here. In fact, there are an infinite number of Pythagorean triples, and it's something that people, mathematicians especially, are very interested in. Now, Pierre de, Fa Pierre de Fermat, very famous French 17th century mathematician. In fact, he wasn't really a mathematician. His day job, he was a judge. He was a judge in Toulouse in the south of France, and when he came home at night, he wasn't supposed to go around mixing with, with people who he might be sentencing, so he did lots of mathematics. In fact, he corresponded with the greatest mathematicians of his day and came up with lots of amazing maths himself. He's known, nicknamed the Prince of Amateurs. So he was looking at Pythagorean, th Pythagorean triples and then wondered, what happens if I you know, turn the knob up? Rather than x squared plus y squared equals z squared, what about x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed? Are there any whole number solutions? Couldn't find any. What about x to the 4 plus y to the 4 equals z to the 4? Likewise, x5 plus y to the 5, you could keep on going. And there we come to his statement of the theorem. He wrote this statement, which we now know is Fermat's last theorem, which is that the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n has no whole number solutions when n is bigger than 2. Now, he didn't do like what a mathematician would do these days, which is write the theorem and then prove it. He actually was reading this book here, The Arithmetica by Diophantus, a very famous Greek mathematician. And on a section about Pythagorean triples, he wrote this statement. And then the sentence, I have a truly marvelous demonstration of this proposition, which this margin is too narrow to contain. Possibly the most famous line in all of the most non-mathematical line in all of mathematics. And the reason why we call it the last theorem, it wasn't the last thing he did, it was the last thing to be resolved because, you know, a famous mathematician says he has a truly marvelous demonstration. Other mathematicians are gonna to want to try and find it, but no one can find it after 100 years, to 200 years, after 300 years. In the middle of the 20th century, it was the most famous unsolved problem in mathematics. In fact, it was the subject of books. And in 1963, when Andrew Wiles was 10 years old, he went and uh, got one of these books out of the library. It's called The Last Problem. And he discovered about this. And he said, I knew from that moment on, I would never let it go. That's Fermat's last theorem. I had to solve it. So as well as an incredible mathematical journey, the story of Andrew Wiles' proof of Fermat's last theorem is a wonderfully inspiring personal journey also. Now, the proof that he found was not something that you could, well, that Fermat, definitely you could put it in a margin, but that Fermat, there's no way he could have known. And it's now assumed that Fermat was mistaken by saying that he had 
a truly marvellous demonstration because the mathematics required to solve it was uh, were only developed, discovered, way after Fermat died. And the two areas of mass that were used, one, elliptic curves, we heard that in the citation, elliptic curves, and the other, modular forms. So I'm going to explain a little bit about these two types of mathematics. So, an elliptic curve. Well, it comes from an ellipse. What's an ellipse? An ellipse, you can't see it very well there, but the, the paths of the planets, planets orbit in ellipses. And at the late 18th century, mathematicians trying to work out the distance along ellipses came up with another type of curve, another, which is an equation. So it's not an ellipse, it's an elliptic curve, and it's of the form, it's a cubic equation, y squared equals x to the cube plus a to the x plus b, where a and b are constants. And what do they look like? Well, you can map these, you can, you can draw these on the x, y axis, and that's what they look like. But if you want to analyze them using complex numbers, which is a little bit more complex, complicated area of mathematics, you can see them in kind of 3D, and the solutions there look a bit like this, which this is a kind of donut that we've sliced. And I don't know if you recognize that slice in a figure of eight, because that is exactly the figure of eight that Arbel was drawing in his famous Lemniscate, which is on Norwegian 20 kroner coins. Okay, that's elliptic curves, this kind of interesting curve that come from ellipses. A modular form, a totally different type of mathematics. A modular form is a type of mapping that has an extremely high number of symmetries. What's a mapping? A mapping is just something that you take a point from one place and you put it somewhere else. It maps something from here to here. Let's think about two different types of mappings now. Imagine you've got this plane here in two different colors, and the mapping is going to be take any point and then move it one horizontally to the right. So just say a point was here, it would map to there. Or if a point was here, it would map to there. This is one type of mapping, the plus one mapping. This is a different type of mapping that takes any point inside the blue hemisphere, or well, hemisphere, it's a semicircle, <laughs> the blue semicircle, and maps it to a unique point outside it. So it would take something from here to a unique point outside it, and likewise, any point in the red would be mapped into the semicircle. Mix these two together, combine them, and you get this image here. And the symmetries that you see in this image are exactly the same symmetries that you get in certain types of modular forms. Okay, so elliptic curves, modular forms, totally different, different areas of mathematics, thought up by different mathematicians using different terminology to solve different problems at different times. Now, in the 1950s, two Japanese mathematicians, Yutaka Taniyama and Goro Shimura, for the first time thought, do you know what, maybe these two areas, these two kind of separate islands in mathematics are actually joined, or that are actually kind of the same thing in, in certain senses. They thought that every elliptic curve could be associated with its own modular form. Okay, what's this got to do with Fermat's last theorem? Nothing yet. Let's look back at Fermat's last theorem. The equation x to the n plus y to the n equals n to the n has no whole number solutions for n is bigger than 2. Now, everyone was trying to prove it because Fermat said it was true. It was his conjecture. But just say it was false. There's also the chance that it was false. So let's say, let's say it's false. So if it's false, then there is a solution to that equation for n is bigger than 2. Let's imagine the solution. Let's call it this. So there's big A to the big N plus B to the N plus C to the N for some A, B, C, and N bigger than 2. Well, in the uh, mid-80s, Gerhard Frey, a German mathematician, took that and managed to create this equation here. And does that look familiar? That's an elliptic curve. But something is weird about this elliptic curve. It looks like it has no modular form, something that was confirmed by Ken Ribbit a couple of years later. But hang on. Look what we've got. If Fermat's last theorem is false, there's a solution to that. Then we get an elliptic curve that has no modular form. But that means the Taniyama Shimura conjecture must be false, because the Taniyama Shimura conjecture says that every elliptic curve does have a modular form. And 
So there's a bit of basic logic here. We've got if A is false, means that B is false. So if Fermat's last theorem is false, means that the Taniyama Shimura conjecture is false. You can do the contrapositive argument, which would be that if the Taniyama conjecture is true, then Fermat's last theorem is also true. So this work in the 1980s translated or replaced the problem or rewrote the problem of solving Fermat's last theorem to the problem of solving or of proving the Taniyama Shimura conjecture. Remember, that's the conjecture that shows that every elliptic curve has a modular form. And this is something that just because it was associated didn't make it any easier. Possibly the fact that it was related to Fermat meant that it was also, we didn't have the mathematical tools to be able to solve it. But Andrew Wiles solved it. How did he do it? This is a very simplified account of how he solved it. Because it turns out that every elliptic curve, you can produce a series of numbers from it, kind of like it's DNA, long sort of string of numbers. You get that, if you understand uh, for the more advanced people in the audience, from its solutions in modular, modular arithmetic. On the side of the modular forms, you can also get a kind of DNA produced there, which are the coefficients of its Fourier expansion. And what Andrew Wiles did, inventing a whole new way of, a whole new toolkit, as we call it, was to show that you could match the DNA of one to the DNA of the other. They were basically identical. So once he had solved it, it's no longer a conjecture, it's called a theorem, and it's called the modularity theorem. And there's another amazing thing about this Andrew Wells' solution, which is not just the mathematics, it's how he did it. Because normally when you do maths, it's collaborative, you talk to people. Andrew Wiles spent seven years solving the problem on his own. He didn't tell anyone else apart from his wife. And in 1993, when he had the solution, he then announced it to cheers here, the picture at a lecture at a conference in Cambridge. It made him one of the most famous mathematician um, of the age, really. And he was on the front cover of the New York Times, and pretty much all the major newspapers of the world. But then there was a problem. A few months later, a gap, a little flaw in the proof was discovered. So he went back, and a year later, with the help of a student, Richard Taylor, managed to fix it. And then in 1995, the final proof was published. And just to show that the amazing kind of personal journey that he went on, because not only is it incredible to solve, to attack a problem like this and get that far, but to find a mistake and then go back and have the focus and the stamina to actually solve it, um, to, to fix the mistake, is almost unheard of in mathematics. So let's just finish again with summing up um, the citation, because yes, what he did was prove Fermat's last theorem, but really he proved something which is much more important, much, much deeper, which is the modularity conjecture or modularity theorem, because it linked these two, or confirmed that there was this connection between these two, until then thought, this different part of mathematics. And through the toolkit that he invented, it has opened up whole new areas of number theory and mathematics itself. Thank you very much.